Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Klein. Yes. On behalf of the organizing committee and the board of the Hellenic Association for our Max and Facial Surgery, we would like to welcome you for being here and sharing your expertise and your experience. And you can deliver your lecture for about half an hour. Okay. Well, I would like to thank the association for the kind invitation. I've had the uh, the uh, privilege of speaking before you uh, prior to this, so it's an honor to be invited uh, to return again. My, uh, my task this morning is to speak about technology and, uh, and dentistry as, it, as we practice it. So let's first take a look at technology as it exists in the, in the world. So here's technology that uh, exists in the automotive industry. Do we have a sound? Yeah, I don't hear it. So this is BMW at work. This is how cars are built today. And the reason that the automotive industry and BMW thinks that it's worth investing in technology is because of the efficiency and the predictability of the outcomes that it's able to predict with the technology that we, uh, that we have. Now we deal with the human body, a far more complex system, right? And the, the, uh, the outcome that we have is much more significant to our patients, at least I would think so uh, if it were, uh, if it were uh, my body. And so shouldn't we be going ahead and using tools to treat our patients, right, with as much care as uh, the automotive industry uses to build cars? So here's where we exist today in dentistry. The digi digital revolution is beginning to mature. The integration of technology has created the integration has created powerful tools. The potential impact on implant dentistry can be significant, but only if we use the tools properly. So take a look. Here's how I use technology today in everyday practice in my office. This is dentistry today, 2018, January 2018. So how does technology affect you know, clinical dental implant treatment? And so the first statement I'll make, it's not about making a hole in bone. And so I didn't come to talk to you today about how I can use a guide and put a, a hole in a precise position. But here's how I use technology today. Here's all the areas that it impacts in everyday dentistry. It's how I collect data. It's how I do restore a treatment plan because that has significant impact on surgically what's going to occur. But when I do surgical treatment planning, it affects not only the implant placement, but also hard and soft tissue evaluation. It creates clinical surgical treatment tools. It creates prosthetic treatment tools. And it creates com custom componentry, right, uh, for prosthesis design and fabrication. So let's add, we're gonna talk about more about one element today in technology, and that's computer-guided surgery. So we've heard, you know, already for many, many years what the advances of computer-guided surgery are. And they include precise treatment planning, surgical and restorative treatment planning, precise clinical procedures, precise surgical and restorative procedures. Treatment can really be restoratively driven. It's not just something we talk about. We can really have restoratively driven treatment. It complements the entire team effort through the use of technology. We can create less invasive procedures, shorter procedure times, it allows usage of custom tools and components. So what are the essential elements? I'm gonna move right along here. What are the essential elements to gain all these advantages of technology in implant dentistry? So here are the key things that we need. We need to collect the appropriate data. 
We need that data includes both either intraoral scanning or laboratory scanning, clinically what exists inside the patient's mouth. CT scanning, today we use cone beam CT, so it's a relatively low dose and it's easy to acquire for the patient. We use prosthetic design software. We use surgical planning software, CNC machining, 3D printing, computer-guided surgical systems, and what I will call technologically compliant implant systems. So what does that mean, technologically compliant implant systems? So number one, in order to be able to do this, there are things called libraries. Libraries are, uh, are, uh, are incorporated within the software that we use to design all the things, whether it's surgical, surgery, or prosthetics. And within these surgical libraries are the designs of implants that allow us to create proper planning. There are restorative design laboratory libraries. And within these restorative design laboratory libraries are all the componentry that are significant or relative to specific systems, and that's important. There's surgical designs for sleeve designs. And then there are, what's also important, are the systems or the surgical systems that integrate within those systems. Now, what are the steps to surgery? So number one is the data collection, right? And what's the data collection? That's the CT scan and diagnostic models. And the diagnostic models can either be scanned in the laboratory or through intraoral scanning. Then there's the virtual wax up, surgical planning, laboratory fabrication of devices, and that includes the surgical guide, the provisional restoration, custom healing abutments, custom abutments, and then we're ready for surgery. But as clinicians, there are really two elements of this that are important to us. Because these are all the only two elements, right, that we need to be involved in. Number one is the data collection, and then we're ready to go do surgery. So all those other steps are things that happen in between, behind the scenes. Guided surgery has been around for a long time. I first became involved in guided surgery probably back in 1999, right? So we're talking about uh, 19, almost 20 years. You know, and so if systems have been around 20 years or so, why isn't everyone utilizing them in their offices? If they can do all the things that I just talked about. And that's because it's been too cumbersome and too costly. Today, because of the integration of technology, we can do it simply. So to admit today in my office, in my clinic, at the initial consultation, the staff collects all this data. They take the cone beam CT, they do an intraoral scan. In five minutes of time, I've collected all the data so that I can have all the advantages right, of technology at the time of surgery. So I didn't add the time, I actually decreased the amount of time, preparation time for the, uh, for the procedure. Right? And then you, you've all seen pictures like this, simple straightforward pictures of different types of systems, right? This is just a pilot guide system that creates an initial osteotomy that allows us to properly position our implants so we can have a very quick, efficient procedure, right? Very straightforward. This is something that we do every day in our offices, you know, all the, all the time. Now, if we get into fully guided systems, which also have existed for, oh, probably about 20 years, what I'd like to present to you is a new concept because sometimes they can be somewhat cumbersome in terms of the systems. You know, how many hands do you need? How many assistants do you need to be involved? Are there sleeves or spoons or different things you need to hold? And so I'd like to introduce a new concept in fully guided surgery. And what that is, is instead of having a sleeve and a guide that guides that drill, what I want to present to you is contra-angle guidance, guidance of the contra-angle itself. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, there are two significant advantages, which I believe have been two problems, two of the central problems in guided surgery. One is how do you irrigate your drills in terms of not overheating the bone and being able to cut efficiently. So number one, we've created a system that allows direct irrigation on the drill through a window in a sleeve that's attached to the handpiece. And by doing that, I can have direct irrigation on the drill through the course of the entire osteotomy preparation. The second is angled entry into the surgical guide. So when we deal with limited interarch space, and with our guided surgical systems, the drills are, are very, very long, and they have to fit over the top of the guide, and it can be uh, somewhat uh, technologically, or not technologically, clinically difficult to go ahead and do, especially when you go into areas of limited interarch space in the posterior mandible and posterior maxilla. Okay, so here are two areas or arenas that uh, in the system that I developed along with the engineers at Paltop to go ahead and address these two, uh, these two problems. So what exactly is contra-angle based guidance? There's a sleeve that fits directly into a specially designed contra-angled head. And within that sleeve, we'll go ahead and here's what the sleeve looks like. We call it a DGS, 
a digital guided sleeve, there's a window where irrigation can come through. The sleeve engages the specially designed contrangle. So there are two holes built into the head of the handpiece that the sleeve engages. And then into that sleeve goes the drills. So all the drills fit in and out of the contra-angle head. And you don't need to change anything. <coughs> okay, so this is contra-angle-based guidance. The latch or the button then will engage both the sleeve as well as the, as well as the drill. And then as you go through a sequence, a series of drills, right, each one just goes in and out of the, of the DGS or digital guided sleeve that's attached to the contra-angle. <coughs> now, the contra-angle, right, with the digital guided sleeve will fit into the, into the drill head, into the sleeve, right? So there's the digital guided sleeve. It will engage the sleeve, and it engages the sleeve before the drill touches bone. And that's how we get guided. So even though you see there's only a segment of the sleeve that covers that drill, we have complete guidance because through the entire course of the procedure, that sleeve is always engaging before the drill is cutting. And then you just bottom it out. You just take the sleeve and you bottom it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, the sleeve with inside the guide. And then there's a whole kit. There are three different lengths of drills. There is a report that tells you which length of drill to use for any specific given, uh, given, uh, given site. All right, so here's what it would look like. The sleeve goes and slides into the contra-angle head. It's held in place with a latch. Right, it's as simple as that. And within that fit, fits the drill. Now, once the initial hole is made, where we use a shorter drill, each drill subsequently after that already fits into the initial hole and is guided by the sleeve and gains accurate, very predictable guidance by the sleeve with inside the, uh, the overall guide. And there's a report, and the report will go ahead and tell you exactly what implant, exactly which sleeve, exactly which uh, size of drill for any specific implant position. Then there's also a, a kit or a tool for delivery of the implants, right? And when you see those numbers, those numbers don't indicate implant length, but it indicates the distance from the top of the guide until the top of where the head of the implant is to be positioned. And that way the implant is go ahead and position properly. So here's what the entire sequence would look like. First, a shorter drill is used that allows engagement of the sleeve prior to the drill touching bone. <laughs> then the drill is changed to a full length drill and you see there's a color band on the drill that indicates the length of the drill. The report tells you, use the purple color that's 25 millimeters long. And then you'll go and you'll switch from drill to drill to drill. Direct irrigation on the drill, easy access to any position in the mouth, because the drill can come in an angled orientation, because the drill doesn't initially engage the sleeve. Then the drills will go ahead and be swapped out to the next diameter, till the ultimate diameter for the implant that's going to go ahead and be positioned. So it doesn't require any additional hands, right? And it is a very, very easy flow or workflow, you know, in a surgical environment to go ahead and do all the, all the uh, preparation. And all the tools, whether they're countersinks, or taps, you know, ahead are fully and completely guided, including placement of the implant itself. Now, you know, there's, and I'm not sure if they're here in Greece, but uh, at least I can tell you in the United States and most of the rest of the world is a, this concept of osteointensification that's been introduced by the company Versa, right? Which is expansion of uh, bone used for narrow ridges and, and uh, closed sinus scraps, okay? There's the Versa of denture drills. So the denture drills actually accommodate directly with the system. So you don't only use, or you're not only limited to the types of drills that are within the kit that comes with this, but the specific drill in 25 millimeters that comes with the Versa Burrs, or with the Versa drills, can be utilized with the system. So you can go ahead and utilize uh, this new concept as, as uh, well for bone expansion. And there's a whole kit and a very simple workflow to go ahead and utilize. So let's go ahead and, and in the few minutes that I have left, I'd like to share with you oh, just several cases that uh, I hope will demonstrate uh, that uh, when we talk about Technology, we're not talking about making the whole, okay? What I've shown you here is one tool that simplifies the process, 
But um, you know, none of this, or fully guided surgery, isn't magic. It doesn't solve all the problems and issues, but it allows us, technology allows us to evaluate the entire patient, right, and, uh, and create an appropriate treatment plan and carry through all the procedures in a simplified manner. So first, a simple patient. This patient is going ahead and presents missing, okay, a single crown, right? Uh, I believe you would call it uh, tooth number 11. In the United States, I would call it tooth number eight. Easy patient, why? If you look at the x-ray, you'll see she had an implant that was placed that I placed seven years before. So she knows already what the whole procedure is going to be. And so we go through the whole workflow. What's the first portion I said? We go ahead and we take models. I take a digital model. I could have just as easily taken a conventional model. The laboratory could have scanned it. And they've done a diagnostic wax up. Digitally, how do they do it? They just mirror image the adjacent tooth because that's what we want for a central incisor. Next, we take a CT scan. On the CT scan, right, we do a surgical planning. We position the implant where we think it needs to be. We have integrated within the concept, right, the integration of the intraoral scan with the CT scan so we can see the profile here of the tooth in proper position. We can analyze the position of the soft tissue that's integrated. We can use evidence-based measurements for positioning of the implants. Here, I'm going to place my implants generally three to four millimeters, right, in the apical position from the free gingival margin position that I'd like to establish. Two millimeters to the palate, so I can account for horizontal bone resorption, right? And I'm going to place it one to two millimeters apical to the position of the most coronal bone I have in the extraction socket because of it, some potential expected resorption of that bone. All evidence-based measurements that I can incorporate pre-surgically. And I do this with the laboratory. So here's step number one, diagnostic wax up. Step number two, surgical planning. Step number three, look at the integration of all the components. Four is fabrication of a guide that will allow me to exactly implement that treatment. That's four and five, creation of the provisional that would be used from all this data to, to insert at the time of a surgery. So here I'm doing an atraumatic extraction using the Benex tool, right? To prevent micro fractures of the buccal bone to limit potential absorption, using the guide to create the osteotomies, placing the implant, right? Using ISQ value to determine if I believe that uh, I will have good predictability in terms of immediate provisionalization, right? Trying in of and uh, uh, an initial looting of the provisional restoration that's created by CNC machining. But again, that doesn't solve all my problems. Here I'm using a, a tunneling technique for soft tissue augmentation that I've developed by Homo Zeta from UCLA. So a buccal tunnel is created, uh, autogenous tissue is harvested from the palate, placed through the tunnel, right? Pulled up into position. So instead of my trying to tuck it in from a, by a crestal incision, pulling it up into position. Here's the provisional finish using a concave design, right? With concave components. And within this concavity is where I will tuck in the soft tissue graft. So the provisional is seated. The connected tissue is now pulled up through the tunnel around the neck of the implant. And this is how the patient walks out of the door 45 minutes after the procedure begins. Now it's done efficiently like that only because everything is pre-planned, no decision making at the time of surgery, with tools that help me implement all the procedures. Here it is four months later, right? And let's compare it to our pre-treatment uh, pre photographs. And let's take a look from a, uh, a soft tissue perspective in terms of uh, position of free gingival margin. I have actually a net gain of tissue, right? I have a, quite a significant volumetric gain, right, in horizontal tissue. This is what I, what I want to go ahead and do. And I end up with a, a what I consider, you know, a more than acceptable result. But as a matter of fact, when I take a look at these two teeth, right, and I did the surgical treatment for both of these teeth, right, I see a difference. And when I go and I look at the new implant, right, the new implant, I see, well, you know, I have some nicer papilla, right, than the older implants. I have a nicer free gingival margin shape, and I will tell you, this is not because of any sculpting of the soft tissue, okay? This is natural healing, right? My bone levels are the same, so what's different? Why do I have a nicer aesthetic appearance of one tooth versus the other? One is, you'll notice my implant position is just slightly more apical, but it has more to do with the design of the interface from the implant, right, through the soft tissue. And by use of concave design of components, right, and creating more space for vascularity of that soft tissue, right, I'm able to have greater volume and healthier soft tissue. And I think that's the entire difference in the aesthetic result by going in and creating that more space. New concepts, right, new concepts that's not done surgically, it's just by selection of the correct type of components. Second case, a little more complex. 
This is a, uh, a, a young girl, 18 years old, right? Generally missing, right? Born missing two mandibular incisors. The orthodontist repositioned the teeth for three incisors, right? And here you see we're just gonna have to replace one tooth. Well, this one tooth is relatively complex, right? What makes the complexity? One is she's you know, 18 years old, right? And her mother is kind of looking over my shoulder. But take a look, we have two, two uh, anatomical problems. One is obvious when you look at it, right? We have recession, right, on, the, on uh, that one central incisor, right? Uh, following the orthodontics because of the thin labial or buccal bone, right? There's been bone loss. But take a look at the thickness of bone. Because there never were any teeth there, the alveolus never grew to accommodate that housing. So take a look at how narrow that bone is, right? And if I were to position an implant in the bone that existed, half that implant on the buckle is going to be, you know, exposed into that, uh, into that uh, I won't even call it concavity, into that absence of, absence of bone. And so this is what the position of the implant and where it would be, right, if I were to place it within that bone. And if I cut the bone down to where the bone was of adequate width, right, take a look at where the head of that implant is going to be. Now, maybe if you were extracting all those teeth and the patient was 60 years old, that's what we would do, simplify the treatment, but certainly not in a, a, an 18-year-old girl. So here's my plan, right? My plan is harvest autogenous blocks or cores of bone from the symphysis, same local area, not a different site, and move it more coronal in position. Right, so that's gonna be the plan. Move bone from that same exact spot in the symphysis, more coronal. So, so limit, the, uh, limit the morbidity relative to the procedure. So here's what it looks like. Here's the site exposed. I've taken these cores from the symphysis. I've moved them more coronal, right? I've done some, uh, some other grafting uh, around adjacent to it. And then I've done a lateral sliding pedicle flap, right? Pre-treating the root of the tooth to cover, right, the recession on the adjacent tooth. So I have to manage that tooth at the same time. Here's what the initial healing looks like after oh, two or three weeks. And here's what it looks like four months later. Okay, now we've got done, this is you know, what we're kind of used to saying, site preparation, we prepared the patient. So we go back to our same workflow now. Now we've taken the intraoral scan with the CT scan, merge the data sets, right? Plan the position of the implant within the bone. You can see now the, uh, the, uh, the volume of bone that, uh, that, we've, that we have here now, right? If you look at this type of software, this is Implant Studio, right? It's the inner aspect that's the implant, the outer is the safety zone. So we have more than enough bone to go ahead and position and place the implant. A guide is now created to position the implant in that exact spot. We open the tissue, place the guide, position the implant in, uh, in within that space, right? And then go ahead and, and remember, positioning of the implant doesn't have to do with exactly where the bone exists. It's all restoratively driven. So I need to place the implant in an apical enough position, right, and create a parabolic architecture within the bone, where you can see here I've created peaks of bone, right, so that I'll end up with nice papilla afterwards, because that's what I need to create for this position. I always use ISQ measurements, I test the implants both before and after, more connective tissue, right, to augment the soft tissue at this point, right, and close the, close the area up. I come back now, now this is what it looks like again, three or maybe it was four months later, and now we're ready to begin the restorative portion of the procedure, open the tissue, place a peak abutment, provisional to start treating and scalloping and shaping the soft tissue, right? So here's what it initially looks like. Tie-based restoration, again, technologically driven restorations is what we go ahead and utilize today, and we're able to go ahead and, you know, finish the patient with what I would consider probably more than an acceptable result, good bone levels on the implant, nice healthy looking soft tissue, patient is on several actually antidepressants, right, and her mouth is relatively dry, which is why you see a little inflammation around the tissue, but I think that uh, probably we have more than an acceptable result. It's something though, although the patient were replacing one missing tooth, is a somewhat complex, uh, complex case. So now let's go ahead and like increase maybe the complexity a little bit. Here's a patient who has previous failed implant treatment, okay? This is what she looks like intraorally. She has two central incisors with class two mobility. She has uh, two molar teeth, significant atrophy of the maxilla, right? That with, uh, due to previously failed implant treatment. And now we're gonna again use technology to implement treatment, right, in a little different way than you're probably used to going and seeing. So we go through the same steps. Now because we have to make a determination of where the, all the teeth need to be, so we incorporate one additional element. So it's not just the CT scan and a digital scan. We need photographs that will be integrated with that so the laboratory at this point can take the intraoral scan data can take the CT DICOM data, 
integrate all of that together, and now do a full diagnostic wax up to determine what the tooth position needs to be for the final restoration for this patient. And so all of this information is amassed, it's all done together. Again, remember, in one appointment, I've gone ahead and taken a CT scan and done an intraoral scan and taken photographs. Not much time, it's five minutes of time, eight minutes of time, we're gonna collect all that data. Now we do a try in to, to verify the vertical dimension and the level and plane where the teeth are going to be placed for the provisional restoration. And now we go ahead and have all the surgical planning finished for the case. Patient comes for surgery, and this is what I have now from the laboratory. I have a box and it has all this material in it. Wow, what's all that stuff? Well, these are all the things that are pre-prepared. It comes pre-packaged from the laboratory. Everything that I need. Surgical guides, printed models, provisional restorations, the materials for curing things in place, the abutments, the implants. Because here's what the procedure looks like. First, I have a positioning device. And I tried the positioning device in to make sure that it seats properly. Buckle flap reflection is now done. Now, you'll see there are two components. I have my positioning device with a frame that I will call a foundation frame and they integrate together. So you see these three boxes with these pin locks? These three boxes over here will engage the foundation frame. And they fit together and lock together. It's seated into the patient's mouth. Lateral uh, holes are drilled through, the, through the, uh, the indicated spots. Pins are placed in the position and it's secured in place. I then open the pin locks and remove the plastic position, printed positioning device. Now this metal piece here, right, is printed chrome cobalt metal. So everything is printed. Both the plastic piece is printed, as well as what I would call the foundation frame, as well as a model that demonstrates what it should look like inside the patient's mouth when it's assembled properly. Now we do bone reduction, right? First I'll use a large double hinge drawn jaws to go ahead and remove the uh, your initial bone. And this foundation guide sets the level for bone reduction. So I know exactly how much bone to reduce because I need to go and make the bone level with that piece. So first I'll go ahead and use a large drawn jaws, and then I'll finish it with a, a large uh, acrylic burr, cutting the bone down to the level of that foundation guide. Now, again, I have a printed model, and the patient's mouth should look exactly like that printed model. So you see, I've cut the bone down to the exactly the same position. I now take the next piece, printed piece. This is a prosthetic platform, and it also engages and locks in place with the pins to the foundation guide. So the provisional restoration now will seat on that foundation guide. So this whole complex fits together. So here's the foundation guide with the prosthetic platform placed in position. And you can see these two rods that are here that allow the provisional to seat directly in place. So before any implants have been placed, any abutments placed, anything engaged, I can test out the position of my provisional restoration. So I don't have to commit at that point. Now I remove the prosthetic platform once I'm happy with that, and this is the surgical guide. Wow, it looks different than any surgical guide I've seen. It's because I'm now using a metal surgical guide that'll have very precise positioning, but again, it engages the pin locks. So it's seated inside the patient's mouth. The, the guided kit now will go ahead and integrate with the system, right? So here I'm using my pilot drill, followed by my subsequent larger drills through the, through the system. Here's what it looks like, the initial pilot osteotomies, a very, very stable guide. There are four uh, lateral pins that are in position to hold the guide in place. I go through the whole sequence of drilling. And again, you see with this guided system, contraangle based guidance, right, it doesn't require you know, any additional hands. Implant delivery into position. ISQ values, again, I do them all on all my cases. The abutments that have been pre-selected and predetermined are now inserted. On the prosthetic platform is tried, is placed in. These positions indicate the positions of angled multi-units, right? So I know exactly how to orient and position my multi-unit. Titanium cylinders are now placed. The provisional is now seated directly onto the prosthetic platform into the exact position. <coughs> and you can see my titanium cylinders in position. The uh, blackout material, so I don't lock my provisional onto any undercuts when the cylinders are, are utilized. And then a quick curing composite light cure material is injected into the holes to fix it ill into position. Now, healing abutments are placed on the multi units, the case is sutured. At the same time, in the laboratory, the provisional restoration is sutured. 
right, and insert it into place. And that's how the patient walks out the door. The procedure itself to do all this is, oh, anywhere from two and a half to three hours to go ahead and perform a procedure like this. And this is what the patient looks like after two weeks or so of healing. So somewhat can be relatively complex, is now through technology turned into a, a very you know, predictable sequence. And there's one last patient I'd like to share with you. This is an 18-year-old girl born congenitally missing 26 teeth. She has two maxillary central incisors, two maxillary first molars, and two mandibular second molars. And so, uh, you know, when you treat a patient like this, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that comes along with it. And at the same time, you'll see how we have the ability to change people's lives. So here, let me share the story of our dental treatment with you. Your time is over, please conclude. This is the end.